Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this uh, first lesson in our gospel meeting with Brother Larry Acuff. You know, I've been excited about this for some time. I was really looking forward to Brother Acuff coming because uh, not only is he a great preacher, but he's a good friend. And I had the opportunity to work with him in the Atlanta area where we lived for 11 years. And he is with the Lithia Springs Congregation, which is uh, just to the west of Atlanta. And uh, in fact, if you are ever in the Atlanta area and are making a trip down to Six Flags, uh, then you might want to pop into the Lithia Springs Congregation on Sunday if you happen to be there over the weekend. And if you'll go on Sunday, that congregation will welcome you warmly and you'll get to hear some good preaching. And uh, I know that they would just really be glad to have you. But we're excited that Brother Acuff is with us this week for our online gospel meeting. We were hoping that he would be able to come and join us, but uh, we're thankful that he is able to join us in this special way. Uh, these lessons that he's presenting this week are lessons that uh, he is preaching for us. These are not lessons that we've downloaded from the internet, uh, but these were lessons that were preached for us here at Westside. And we're excited that he was willing to do that and appreciate uh, the effort that he and others uh, made to uh, put these uh, videos together and send them to us so that we could share them uh, uh, among ourselves as the Westside congregation. But we're not going to keep these lessons just to ourselves. We're going to share them uh, on the internet. And so you may be watching this on our website, maybe you're watching this on YouTube, or you may even be watching this on Facebook. And we're excited that you've joined us in one of these mediums, and we look forward to uh, learning and growing together. You know, isn't it wonderful that we live in a time where we can use technology to hear and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Thank you for joining us. We look forward to our time together, and may God bless you as we grow together. for me to be with you and what this is, I guess, identified uh, as a virtual meeting. Uh, I want to express my appreciation to the elders of the West Side Church in uh, Salem, Virginia. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation that you have extended to me uh, to be a part of a gospel meeting in this area. Of course, uh, the meeting had been scheduled for three or four years, I don't remember. Uh, and of course, because of the situation with the pandemic, uh, it was determined that this would be the wise way in order to do this. But I want you to know how much I appreciate uh, the confidence that you had in me uh, to give me this initial invitation uh, and to give me this opportunity to come and study the Bible. Uh, my wife and I, Janet, we were looking forward to being in this area. No, it's a beautiful area. Uh, I have seen uh, the Facebook uh, posts that Brother Neil Ritchie has made of the area, and I thought, wow. Uh, what a beautiful place to be, and I know that you folks are certainly enjoying 
uh, having Brother Neil and his family with you as your uh, local preacher. I've known Neil for several years when uh, he was at the Piedmont Road Church uh, in Marietta. Uh, we love and appreciate him. We've had him speak at uh, Lithia Springs where I am the preacher. Uh, and so I just am very appreciative of Brother Neil and uh, certainly the elders and for this opportunity. And I trust, uh, you can get your Bible, we're going to be studying in just a few minutes, but I trust that uh, as you and I study the Holy Word of God that it will be beneficial uh, to you. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure some of you maybe watch, maybe you don't even care, but uh, I'm often asked, my name is Larry Acuff, I'm often asked, uh, are you kin to Roy Acuff? Uh, you know, now, some of you may not even know who Roy Acuff was. I think it was Dizzy Dean uh, who identified Roy Acuff uh, as the king of country music uh, many, many years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was interesting. Uh, the Japanese, uh, they cursed uh, three people. I forget uh, two of them. One of them was Dizzy Dean. One of them was Roy Acuff uh, because he had done so much during World War II uh, for the troops. And so uh, his name, at least at that point, was prominent. Uh, but I'm asked a lot, are you kin to Roy Acuff? I was in a gospel meeting in Middle Tennessee several years ago. Uh, and after the service, I'm shaking hands with folks as they were uh, coming out of the auditorium. And uh, so this lady came up to me and she said, Brother Acuff, are you kin to Roy Acuff? And I said, uh, yes, ma'am, I am, but I can't sing. She said, well, he couldn't either. So uh, we've, her name was Sister Elizabeth Knight. She passed away here not too long ago, but uh, she was a gracious lady. One of the things also, Roy Acuff yo-yoed a lot on uh, the Grand Ole Opry. And so the next time I was in a meeting in that area, uh, Sister Knight brought me a yo-yo. I carry it with me. It's in my briefcase. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I'm just thankful for this opportunity. I want to encourage you, get your Bibles. I want you to turn to the book of Matthew chapter number 7. We're going to focus on that passage uh, in Matthew chapter number 7. And we're going to be looking at uh, verses 7 through 11. As you and I discuss the subject today, ask, seek, and knock. When you and I study the Bible about prayer, now there is a parallel passage to this uh, in the book of Luke chapter 11 verses 1 through 14. But in Matthew chapter 7, our Lord Jesus Christ said, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For he that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and he that knocketh to him the door shall be opened. And then our Lord uses an illustration. Uh, and he talks about a, a, a father, a son, ask uh, for bread. He does not give him a stone. He asks for a serpent, he does not, or ask for a fish. He doesn't give him a serpent. So when you and I look at this topic of asking, seeking, and knocking, then you and I see again this great opportunity of prayer. In Luke chapter number 11, in verse number 1, here's an interesting passage. Uh, the Bible says, and watch this, folks, because the disciples did not come to our Lord Jesus Christ and say to him, uh, teach us how to preach. And we have preacher training schools. We have men who go to our universities, and uh, the purpose of doing so is in order to be better gospel preachers. But they didn't come to our Lord and say, will you teach us how to preach? They didn't come and say to our Lord, uh, teach us how to teach. They came to our Lord in Luke chapter 11, verse number 1, and they said, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. If you go down to the book of Luke, chapter number 18, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter number 18 uh, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, you're familiar with all, I'm sure, passages of Scripture uh, in the Holy Bible. Uh, in Matthew chapter number 6, you remember that our Lord uh, gave us a model prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, you, you already know that by heart. You and I know what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 17 when he made this statement. He said, pray without ceasing. So you're not familiar with prayer. We know what the Bible teaches on prayer. So as you and I look at this topic today, uh, ask, seek, and knock, 
then you and I need to come to an understanding of what our Lord is saying in Matthew chapter number 7, uh, verses 7 through 11. Now, there are three things that I want you and I to look at in this passage of Scripture. Number one, we're going to look at instruction in prayer. Now, when you and I look at this, notice this. The Bible says, ask. Now, when you go back to the Old Testament for an example, uh, one of the great uh, examples in the Old Testament uh, would certainly be David in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12 uh, and verse number 6. You remember, David had a child, and that child was sick. He prayed, to, he wouldn't eat, he wouldn't bathe, he wouldn't do anything. They, what do we do? David is praying for that child. And if you'll remember, David prayed that God would spare that child. God would save that child. He did. God said no. God said no. You know when David, when David, they came and told David, said, David, you know, that child is dead. They were afraid. That, well, what is he going to do if he doesn't eat and doesn't bathe uh, and doesn't do any of these things while the child, what is he going to do now that he knows the child is dead? They come and tell him. David gets up, bathes, bring me something to eat. I cannot bring the child back to me, David said, but I can go to him. But here's what I want you and I to see in this passage of Scripture. And that is the simple fact, ladies and gentlemen, that God said to David, no. Let me give you another illustration out of the Bible. Go with me to the Old Testament again. There is a man in the Old Testament by the name of Hezekiah. Now, there are two records of this. One uh, in the book of 2 Kings chapter number uh, 20, and then also Isaiah chapter number 38. But when you go to the passage of Scripture, either one of these, and what do you find out is that Isaiah, God said, you tell, you tell Hezekiah, get his house in order, he's going to die. Now, my friend, have you ever thought about how you would react in that kind of a situation? Oh, <laughs> Yeah, you're going to die. Listen, folks, there are those who uh, have had terminal illnesses. They've gone into the hospital. Maybe they've gone to a doctor. They've just not felt well. They go to a doctor, and the doctor said, Look, I, I hate to tell you this, but you have a term. You're going to live maybe three months. I remember several years ago, uh, I, there was a, a gentleman I was told uh, he had about three months to live. He didn't last three months. And so Isaiah said, Hezekiah, you're going to die. What did Hezekiah do? Well, I, I, I'm going to die again. No. No. He wept. He begged the Lord. He said, look at what I'm doing. Look at what I have done. God said, Isaiah, you go back to Hezekiah, and you tell him I'm going to give him 15 more years. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I, when we, we look at, so what does a guy do? He went before God in prayer, and God said, I'll give you 15 more years. Look at another illustration with me. Back again in the Old Testament, uh, in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel, they have sinned. Moses has gone on the mountain. He has gotten the law. God said, you better get back down there, and I'm paraphrasing all this. You better get back down there. Man, there's a mess going on, and you know what took place. God said, I'm going to, Moses, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy these people, and I'm going to raise up a nation after you. Moses said, God, if you kill them, kill me too. Don't do that. You know what God said? Okay. God's answer was yes. You know, as you and I look at Scripture, and we go, for an example again, and we go back to the Old Testament, and uh, we see Elijah, uh, 1 Kings chapter number 17, uh, the widow's son. You remember that? Goes back to this passage of Scripture in 1 Kings 17, and uh, Elijah, the widow's son, was dead. What, what, what did Elijah do? He prayed. You know what God said? Okay, I'll, I'll spare the child. I'll raise the child up. He resurrected him. Now, what are we seeing, folks? You and I look at, we look at David, and God said no. We look at Hezekiah, and God said yes. We look at Moses, and God said yes. We look at Elijah, and God said yes. 
Go with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 16, verses 6 through 10. You, you remember that Paul said, I want to go into a certain area. I want to go to a certain area. No, no, I don't want to do that. So when you and I look at this, folks, and then we come to this understanding, when you look at that word ask, for an example now, go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 26. And you find a record of this in, in Luke and John as well, or and Mark. In Matthew chapter number 26, the Bible tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ went into the Garden of Gethsemane three times. He goes into the garden and he says, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And you remember he goes out and they've gone, they have fallen asleep. He goes back into the garden a second time. And you remember the scripture describes the agony of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that sweat was as if it were drops of blood. And so God, or Christ goes back into that garden. And a second time he prays. And he comes back. They're asleep again. He does it three times. Now, you know, in the Hebrew letter, in Hebrews chapter number uh, 5 or 7 or 5, you look at this, uh, the, the Hebrew letter says that our Lord Jesus Christ went before him who is able to save him. Him who is able to save him. He went before him in tears. And God said, no. Now, my friend, when you and I recognize this, and we go back to and look at Matthew chapter number 7, ask, and it shall be given to you. So when you and I search out the Scriptures, and when you and I look at, at what the Holy Bible has to say to us, uh, now, let, let's look at that other word. Look at the word seek, ask. See, we're looking at this instruction in prayer. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Now, that, that word seek has a different connotation to it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, in Isaiah chapter number 55, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. There's a time, my friend, when you and I seek the Lord. There is a time when you and I say, you know, the Bible says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So you and I look at this word seek. Let me look at, for an example, you're familiar with these passages, I'm sure, but in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33, you remember what the Bible says? But seek ye, what's, huh? Do what? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, my friend, listen to this. There is, there is something about seeking that you and I need to understand. Uh, you know, several years ago, our daughter was a student at uh, David Lipscomb University. I don't remember what year this was, uh, but at any rate, uh, I think she, she was wor at Christmas, during the Christmas holidays, she was working at Vanderbilt Hospital. And so what she, she was staying in an apartment with some other uh, young ladies. And so um, one night, this, this was on December the 31st, and it was midnight. We received a call. My wife and I received a call uh, from the girls in the apartment, and they said, Mr. Acuff, we, uh, we thought you need to know that about a half an hour or so ago, April called us and told us she was on our way. She had worked at Vanderbilt that night. She was on her way to the apartment. She never did arrive. And not only that, but we got a strange phone call uh, to, for a collect call. And so we thought you need to know about this. Ladies and gentlemen, what? well, I, I'm glad you called. I'm going back to bed. No, no. My wife and I, we, we began to get dressed, called her brother, asked him if he would come to our house. Uh, we lived in Sparta, Tennessee. Come to our house, uh, stay. Uh, Janet and I are going to Nashville. Why? Because we're going to seek after our daughter. We didn't just say, well, I hope she shows up. 
We were getting ready to leave, and she called the house. April did. She said, hey, Dad, Happy New Year. I said, Happy New Year to you, my eye. I'm ready to kill you right now. What's the matter with you? Well, I, I told her what it takes. She said, well, I left the hospital, and as we were going out, some of the other girls there said, let's go out and get something to eat. And uh, so I, I didn't want to wake the girls up in the apartment, and so I went, uh, we went out to, to get, and, and I said, well, what about this collect call? She said, well, uh, her now, <laughs> her husband now, at that time, they were dating. Brian uh, lived in uh, New York, and uh, so she had wanted to call and talk with him. I want you to understand something, folks that this concept of seeking, that you and I, we ask, yes, but then the Bible says you seek. In the book of Colossians chapter number 3, the Bible says if you then be risen with Christ, verse number 1, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the throne of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. You are dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. But you see in Colossians chapter number 3, the Bible says seek. In the book of Psalm, one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm number uh, 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. But in verse number 4, one thing shall I seek after, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of of the Lord forever, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. In the book of Luke, you're familiar with this passage, Luke chapter number 2, they were seeking for our Lord, his parents. They, they, they found it was not, they went back to seek after our Lord. So the Bible says, ask and it shall be given to you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened. Bang on that door, ladies and gentlemen. So when you and I, when we look at ask, seek, and knock, and we see the instruction that God has given to us, then you and I recognize again that what we are endeavoring to do, and that is to search God out and ask Him to answer our prayer. Now I want, to, I want you to see a second thing, and that is insight into prayer. See, when you and I look at prayer, there is a certain insight that we have from the scriptures on this. Uh, now, we have the instruction. The Bible said here, here's what I want you to do. When you and I look at the insight in the prayer, I want you to see there's really four things I want you to see. Number one, I want you to see the person of prayer. Now, in 1 Kings chapter number 18, oh, I love that chapter. <laughs> I love that chapter. Uh, Elijah confronts the 450 priests to Baal. You remember that? Uh, if the Lord be God, then serve him. If Baal be God, then serve him. How long will you halt between two opinions? And you know what took place. They had a contest that day. And God, let me tell you something, folks. God's always going to win in a contest. In less than a 15-second prayer, fire came down from heaven. It consumed not only the the sacrifice, but the wood, the stones, and the water. But now, when you go to the end of 1 Kings 18, the Bible tells us about Elijah. He goes upon Mount Carmel, and he begins to pray. Hadn't rained in three and a half years. He begins to pray. Now listen to this. The Bible says he was a man of like passion. A man of like passion passion. He prayed that it might not rain. It didn't rain. He prayed that it rained. It did. Am I a person of prayer? Is, is, is prayer going to be, a, is that going to be a part, ladies and gentlemen, of my life? Is it going to be part uh, of my Christianity? So when you and I look at this, we see that here was a man, the person of, but I want to show you something else. Not only the person of prayer, but you need to see the place of prayer. Hebrews 4, verse number 16, listen to what the Bible says. Therefore, let us come boldly where? Under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So let us come, therefore, boldly. Uh, folks, listen to this. Oh, I, if I needed some money, there's people I'd call probably wouldn't have it or loan it to me if they did. I don't know. 
But the throne of grace, ladies and gentlemen, is where we can go as God's children. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, the Bible said, and his ears are open unto their prayers. Let me give you another thing. Not only the person of prayer, Elijah, not only the place of prayer, and of course that is the throne of grace, but think about the perseverance of prayer. You know, over in Matthew chapter 7, knock and it shall be, and, and you know, in Matthew or in Luke's account of that, you remember, man, the Bible tells, it goes, bangs on the door. Hey, I've got a visitor, come, and I've got to feed him. Give me some bread. Oh, get out of here. Leave me alone. I'm asleep. My kids are asleep. Don't bother me. Man, I, 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 I've got a visitor. I need some bread. Get up and get me some bread. Oh, oh. Oh, I don't want to, but shut him up. I'll get him the bread. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. Perseverance in prayer. Several years ago, I was holding a meeting for the East End Church in McMinnville, Tennessee. I think at that time, Brother uh, Gary Colley was the preacher there. It was on a Sunday morning. I had preached, and at the invitation, uh, a, a gentleman came down the aisle. His wife was with him. And when he sat down and, and then what he wanted to do, he, he wanted to be baptized in the Christ. I don't know how old he was. He was, uh, he was an old, not, I don't mean elderly gentleman, but he probably up in his late, I don't remember, it doesn't matter. His wife, he was baptized that day. We were out in the foyer talking after the service. She said, Brother Acuff, let me tell you something. I have prayed for this for 30 years. It took 30 years. She never gave up. His name is Jim Cunningham, very faithful, godly man, tremendous Christian, grandchildren, obey the gospel, son-in-law, an elder of the Bobby Branch Church now in McMinnville, Tennessee. But do you see the perseverance? Now let me give you another thing when we look at the insight into prayer. Look at the word promise. When you and I, let's see, God has promised us. Uh, you know, Acts 17, you're familiar with this. God, we know God here is not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Uh, John chapter number 15, we ask anything in his name. And the Bible said he hears us. So when you and I, ladies and gentlemen, are searching for this and we're, we're looking at prayer and we're looking at what the Bible tells us about the subject of prayer, ask, seek, and knock, and we see that there's a person of prayer, that there's a place of prayer, that there's perseverance in prayer, but the greatest thing is the promise that God has said, I will listen. You know, there are some folks that won't listen. <laughs> you can... You, what, my mother used to use this, I love blue in the face. I don't know where that came from. So number one, we've looked at instruction in prayer. Number two, we've looked at insight in the prayer. Now number three, I want to look at in-depth examination of prayer. Now, if you have a Bible, you can turn to the book of James, chapter number 4, and, and, and these, these things I'm going to tell you here are all found in uh, James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. The first thing I want you to see here is, now actually, there are, three, there are three kinds of prayer that we'll see in James, chapter number 4. Number one is, listen, the unasked prayer of a struggling person. In verse number 2, you ask, or excuse me, you receive not because you ask not. You receive not because you ask not. Now, is that not what we have said in Matthew chapter 7 and Luke chapter 11? So that unasked prayer. There are things that you and I may need, but we don't ask. Let me give you a second thing here. And that is the unanswered prayer of a selfish person. You know, the Bible says you ask and receive. Not why? Because you ask amiss. My wife and I have been married for 58 years, 59. Well, I don't know what day of the week it is, hardly. But at any rate, we've been married many years. 
she came home me one day. She had been to the grocery store. And she came home after a few days. She said, Larry, I met this guy at the grocery store. He's smarter than you. He's better looking than you. But he's broke. He and I have been dating. We did, I didn't tell you. He and I are going to Florida for a two-week vacation, and we want you to pay for it. You got to be nuts. Huh? Now, you know that didn't happen, folks. But let me tell you this. That's how we deal with God. See, how we deal with God is we want to do our will. We want God to pay for it. See, unanswered prayer of a selfish individual. And I want you to see this. The unhindered prayer of a spiritual person. When you look at verses 5 through 8. Now, you know, you, he said in, in James 4 verse 4, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the Lord is enmity with God. Whosoever be a friend of the Lord is an enemy. Okay. What hinders prayer? Or what causes God to listen to our prayers? Or to answer our prayer? Well, I'm going to give you... Five things very quickly. Number one, we must be sensitive. James, all this in James chapter number four. We must be sensitive to Scripture. The Bible, he tells us in verse number five, do you think the Scripture saith in vain? Are you sensitive to Scripture, my friend? Secondly, we must be submissive to the Father. The Bible says, submit yourselves therefore unto God. Uh, verse number 8 says, draw near unto God. So are we submissive to the Father? Here's the third thing, and that is, do we stand against the devil? See, the Bible tells us, verse number 7, the Bible in James 4, verse 7, resist the devil. Have we separated ourselves from the world? For an example, my friend, the Bible says, cleanse your hands, you sink simple mind. You cleanse your hands. You clean you up your life. Separate yourself from the world. And then, of course, number five is the seriousness of our purpose. You know, in verse number nine, he says, be afflicted and, and mourn and weep. In-depth examination of prayer, James chapter number four. I heard a story, read it somewhere, about a young shepherd boy out, out in the field. And he was out there in the field, and he saw a beautiful flower. Man, it was beautiful. And, and he, he, got, he began to examine it closely, and, and then, I mean, he got down on his hands and knees, and he began to dig around it, and he lifted it up. And when he did, there was a kind of a mountain range behind him. And, and it was kind of like a gate opening and, and flower, I mean, a beautiful thing. And, and you know, light shining, and, and it drew him. He went back to that. It was a cave. And he goes into that cave, and he begins to, oh man, jewels and gold, all kind of beautiful things. And he just begins to gather them up. He gathers, gathers them up. And as he's got all he can get, he starts out the door, and a voice says, Don't forget the main thing. He looks and around, doesn't see anything, starts on out. Again, the voice says, don't forget the main thing. But he goes on out. And when he gets outside and that mountain, that door, the light goes, it shuts up. And everything he has in his hand, all of this gold and pearl, whatever it is, turns to dust. He had left that plant back in that cave. Ladies and gentlemen, don't leave prayer in the cave. Go before the throne of God. Let me encourage you today, if you're not a Christian, you need to obey the gospel of Christ. The Bible teaches us, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Romans 10, 17, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then upon hearing the word of God, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 and verse number 6, uh, without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So you and I believe in Jesus as the Son of God. We change our life 
We change our life by repenting of our sin. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And of course, that's what Peter said to the folks on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Repent. So we hear the word of God and we believe in Jesus as the Son of God. We change our life by repentance. And the Bible says to us, with the, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, with the heart man believe in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We have examples of that. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Uh, Acts chapter number uh, 8, you remember the Ethiopian uh, eunuch, and he said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And we make that beautiful confession, and then we're baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. The Bible says, 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward our Father. We hear the word, we believe it, we repent, we confess Christ, and we're baptized for the remission of our sins. Perhaps there is someone today who has been listening to this message who has made the determination to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sin. Maybe, ladies and gentlemen, you've wandered away from the fold. You haven't been faithful. Maybe you need the prayers of the church. We extend an invitation to you to respond to the message of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light.